Hello, everybody. This is Charlie Sandlin. And before we get into the show, I want to throw out a hypothetical to you that perhaps maybe you can relate to. A defining moment that I think happens to every actor. And it's this moment where you realize, maybe after one year, maybe after five years, maybe after ten, of cobbling together some training and trolling around Los Angeles or New York City, there comes a moment when you realize, I don't really know how to act. I've taken my monologue class, my on-camera class, my scene study class. I've memorized a lot of lines, gotten a lot of notes from a lot of different acting teachers, and I don't know how to act. I don't know what to do when I grab a script. I don't have a way of working. And I guess what I want to talk about is what happens and what you do after that moment. What's the decision you make for yourself? We're going to talk about the importance of training yourself if you want to be a really serious first-rate actor. The show is called Creating Behavior. Put the phone in your pocket. We're going to start right now. My fellow daydreamers, my name is Charlie Sandlin, and you are listening to episode four, A Defining Moment. And we'll get into that defining moment here in a second, but I wanted to give you a little update uh, about my life, and you know, I will tell you, as of this recording, we are still in Guatemala, if you can believe it. We are in the middle of week eight, and I guess the, the positive thing to report is that we now have a flight booked. We are getting ourselves back into New York City. We're flying out of here on May 23rd. So I have mixed feelings about this, quite honestly. We've been down here now with Trisha's parents, and they have a a beautiful home, and they have a nice wraparound garden, and I'm able to put my feet in the grass every morning, and, you know, there's rose bushes and flowers and butterflies and caterpillars and hummingbirds. And I mean, you know, if you're going to be quarantined, there are many, many, many worse places than Trisha's parents' home. I've been very, very grateful to both of them. And it's been really lovely being down here. So in in many respects, Trisha and I are dragging ourselves back to New York because we have to. And we've got to take care of our, our dog and our cat, you know, who I, I hope still remembers us. I just been breaking my heart not being able to see Wally and, and, and even the mean evil cat Mia. And then going back to our apartment, which really compared to where we've been is gonna feel like a shoebox. And, you know, just the day to day life of navigating in one of the dangerous parts of America right now. And so, yeah, there we go. I'm, 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 I'm mixed about it, but we're doing it and we've got to move forward. And both of us have big decisions to make about our businesses and how we're going to move forward and where we're going to live. You know, our lease runs up at the end of July. So we're going to be looking for an apartment, probably a cheaper place. I mean, all these things that are confronting not just me, but all of you in various ways. But that being said, I think we can still talk about your acting career and talk about art and talk about artistry. And today I'm focusing on this defining moment that I think every single actor has. It's just a question of how you respond to it. And that is the moment when you realize that you really don't know how to act. Some people end up being okay with that. They say, you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm myself. I can memorize my lines. I'm auditioning. I'm, I'm getting some work here and there. And you might not give a fuck, right? And the 
other side of that, the other possible answer, is the answer that I'm interested in. And this goes back to the very first episode when I just said to you uh, at the top, what's the vision of the type of actor you want to be? And I would think that all of you that are listening here, your aspirations aren't five lines on Law & Order. Right? You want to take on rich, complicated human beings. You want to be able to walk into a room, walk onto a set, and be able to create organic, vivid, fully realized human behavior. And the great work, the, the lead roles, the guest spots, the recurring roles, the major roles of Western theater, right? The Eugene O'Neill's and the Edward Albee's and the Susan Laurie Parks and the Martin McDonough's and the August Wilson's require a tremendous physical instrument. That means you have to be able to access your rage, your heartbreak, your joy, your silliness, your grief, your shame, your excitement, your silly side. You've got to be comfortable with conflict and you've got to be comfortable with intimacy, right? I mean, I think ultimately you can break acting down essentially to two things, conflict or intimacy. And you have to be able to function from both of those places inside of you. And whether it's a heated argument or you're lying in bed with a lover or your wife, you have to be so open and so available to the other person. That takes an instrument that is really sensitive, really vulnerable, and capable of being played upon and changed by another human being, which is what you want if you're serious about acting. And the parts of yourself that you need to access, you really do spend most of your life repressing. I mean, we don't walk around life trying to function from our rage, from our shame, from our humiliation, right? Very powerful, powerful parts of the human experience. We do everything we can not to feel, which is, I think, the reason why we are drawn to actors, why we go to the theater and why we go to film and television is so that we can live vicariously through you. And this really kind of just feeds into my own personal image of what an actor is. You know, I think of actors as this vessel of life, this, this lung, really, that's able to walk on stage, be able to walk in, in front of a camera and breathe in, experience, process it, and be able to express it in a very personal way over and over again, from moment to moment to moment. And that's not easy to do. And, you know, Martha Graham, the, the mother of modern dance, right, one of the, the greatest artists, certainly, that our country has ever produced, had a really famous quote, and, and uh, many really famous ones, but one she said is that, Technique will set you free. And this is what I think most actors don't appreciate and don't understand, is that you need technique. It is essential to every single art form, a way of working. It is the one thing that will help guarantee consistency. And maybe you guys can relate to this. You've been in rehearsal, maybe you've been on stage, maybe you've been on set, and this moment happens. This moment with another actor or actors where you were completely out of your head, you were in the moment, you were spontaneous, you were alive, you actually came to life in the imaginary world. And you hear cut or you walk off stage and... Like your fucking mind is blown. You're like, wow, that was, that was like a fucking drug, man. That felt incredible. I don't know what just happened. I don't know how I did it, but God, that felt good. I want to do it again. And so you try to recreate that the next take or the next night. And somehow it doesn't go the same way. You're not alive. You weren't in the moment. It just, it was like this, this moment that just puff came and gone this moment of what it felt like to be a real actor now 
the hard thing is to take that moment and allow it to be just the way you work every single time. That's not easy. And what's going to make that possible for you is knowing how the fucking work. Plain and simple. See, because I think what you want as an actor is to never be bad, right? You want to be able to always walk into a room and consistently do good work. And depending on what your talent level is, sometimes you'll be really good. Sometimes you might even be brilliant. But you never want to be bad. And that's what training will allow you to prevent. Well, it takes me to this, this next point, right? Um, and I'll start, I'll start off by saying that uh, this Picasso quote is brilliant, and I love it, and I'll talk about it. And the quote is this. He said, all children are artists. The problem is how to remain an artist once you've grown up. And that shit is the truth. The artist in you right now is that two-year-old. It's that two-year-old who is open and curious and playful. You know, if you ever watch children particularly really small ones, they're so consumed with the present moment, right? They're not worried about the past. They're not stressed out about the future. They're just all consumed about what's going on right now, right here. And they don't give a fuck, you know? They can make a, an ass out of themselves, and it doesn't matter. So there are a lot of things that happen to us as we grow up. Three big ones. We are parented, we are socialized, and we are educated, right? And we are fucked up to varying degrees by all three of those. We're fucked up by our parents, we're fucked up by society and the, the pressures that are put on us culturally, and, you know, we're fucked up by our teachers to varying degrees. And we learn over our life to build up these walls, that we use to protect us, right? The shield that keeps us from being hurt, that allows us to be able to get through life and to stay employed and to have relationships and not end up in prison, hopefully. <laughs> um, but it walls up that artist in you. And I think if you want to be really good, you have to be able to chisel away at all of those parts of yourself that keep you from being open, vulnerable, free, empathic, and out of your head. There are a number of skills that you need in order to create the flawless illusion of life. Certainly, to be able to do it consistently, take after take after take, night after night after night, right? When we watch really good acting, we are watching life unfold for the first time, and that's really difficult to do. You know, if I'm sitting with my therapist... And I'm talking to her about the day my dad died, right? And I'm, you know, talking to her about, you know, that morning I was in rehearsal for uh, this very avant-garde production of Macbeth that I was in. And we were getting ready to do our final, you know, uh, dress rehearsal. And uh, we were getting ready to move into the theater. We were opening in like a week. And, you know, I, I talk about being on the phone with my mom and and you know, her holding the phone up to my dad and telling him that it's okay to go and that he's been a great father, right? This very profound moment in, in my life. My therapist is not going to stop me and say, you know, Charlie, can you go back? Just go back a few moments to when your mother puts the phone up to your father's ear and you're making this huge assumption that he can hear you and you're talking about letting him go. Could you, I think I want to see some emotion there. Can you just well up for me a little bit? And I think, you know, as you're talking about it, I think it makes you uncomfortable. And I think why don't you just swallow it right back down and just, you know, you can take a few moments to compose yourself, but can we just go back and, and, and can you, can you tell me that again? <laughs> you know, I mean, my therapist isn't going to ask me that, but a director could, a director will. And you got to be able to go back, take that adjustment, and be able to make it work, to be able to create the behavior that you need to for the moment. And that takes skill. But when I was a 20-something actor, 
moving to New York City in 1993, I, I didn't really understand that. And I guess, for me, my defining moment was a very profound one. It's the moment when I realized that I did not know how to fucking act. And it came to me after I, I went to MoMA for the first time. Now, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in Midtown Manhattan, is one of you know our country's great museums, one of the world's great museums. And I remember strolling into their abstract expressionist wing. And it's the first time that I actually laid eyes on a de Kooning. And if you don't know who Willem de Kooning is, he's one of the great abstract expressionist painters. He was a, a contemporary, of, you know, Pollock and, and Gorky. And he's got an iconic painting, and it was hanging there in the middle of this room, and it's called Woman One. I will, I will link it up on the site so you guys can and can learn a little bit about de Kooning. But it's this, it's this painting. It's huge. It's probably I don't know, maybe six or seven feet tall, maybe four or five feet wide, and it's this. This, this painting of, I mean, it looks like a woman, but it's not, right? So there's this, um, you know, you can tell that there's some breasts there, but her face is kind of skeletal. And the whole painting is these very just, I would say, violent, these, these, these violent strokes, these big, broad strokes that kind of slash the painting. And it's these really beautiful colors, yellows and, and, and oranges and, and greens. And I mean, I just looked at it and I thought, wow, that is just so fucking cool. That's amazing. And it's considered, you know, <laughs> one of the 20th century's great American paintings. And, you know, I'm looking around this room and I see Robert Rauschenberg and his, one of his famous works where he, he took his bed, literally his entire bed, and he threw it up on the wall and he painted it. And I'm talking about the frame, the mattress, the sheets, the pillows, and he painted his bed. And it's like one of his most famous works. I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I look and I see this Pollock mural. This mural is probably, I don't know, 15 feet wide, 10 feet tall. And it looks like somebody just went into the garage, took a paintbrush, and just dripped 100 different colors of paint on this, on this canvas. And I just thought, well, my God, I want to paint. I want to be a painter. I want to be an actor. I want to be a painter. I want to be able to do it all, you know. And so um, I, I, I go to the, the paint store and I spend hundreds of dollars that I didn't have on all this stuff. I bought an easel. I bought can, a canvas. I bought these paints, brushes. I go to this kitchen store and I buy a spatula. I buy, you know, all these utensils, these different knives because I thought, I'm, I'm going to paint now. I'm inspired by this. And I was dating this a woman at the time. She was an investment banker. She uh, had no, no interest in acting, wasn't... Uh, uh, part of her life at all, you know, and clearly the relationship did not work out. But at the time, uh, I thought it was fun. And I come home with all this stuff. And, you know, she's like, what are you doing? I said, Oh, babe, I'm going to paint. I'm going to start painting now. And, uh, you know, she rolls her eyes because she, you know, she just thought, you know, I was crazy. Um, and so I did, I set, I set up my easel and I, and I, I, I started painting. I started doing what I saw at MoMA. I'm taking these paints and I'm dripping it all over the canvas. I'm doing all these big slashing movements and, and I'm having a blast. I can tell you that. I was enjoying myself. And, you know, as I'm doing this, my girlfriend at the time, she says, well, why don't you, why don't you, before you do that, like, why don't you just sit down and like try to draw this chair? Why don't you just go down to like some basic stuff? I said, babe, come on. Don't interfere. I'm the artist in the relationship. Come on, you know, and, and I rolled my eyes at her and I continued on and I finished and I stepped back and it was a piece of shit. Like it was awful. It didn't, uh, it, it didn't look like anything. It looked like, you know, somebody just puked on, on this, on this canvas. And I just thought to myself, huh, I'm doing what I saw at MoMA. I'm, I'm kind of doing what I, you know, Pollock did. He's dripping shit all over the canvas and, de Kooning was just making these big strokes across the canvas, you know. And this light bulb went off for me. And, and I have to say, this was my defining moment. This was the, the moment. And this is now after being in New York for five, almost five years, trolling around and, um, you know, trying to, to, to act. It's the moment where I realized I 
didn't know how to act. I certainly didn't know how to paint. I didn't put any time into learning how to do it. I didn't know anything about the art form. I didn't sit down and learn the, the, the very fundamental basics of drawing and painting. I just appreciate art. I just love it. But I'm not a painter. And when I read about de Kooning, and I read his biography, and I, I, I discovered how many years in his young life he spent in art school and drafting and learning how to draw on a, just a very basic level. When I read about how when he was young, he would keep a kind of a, a he put this wired kind of mannequin together where he took a, a pair of a pants, jeans, and he, he put them up so it looked like kind of a half a torso because he would work every day on trying to draw that as realistically as he could. And this was years before he became famous for all of his abstract art, his abstract expressionism. He put decades into his craft. And that was the moment when I realized I, I don't really know how to act. I love acting. And I certainly have taken some classes here and there, and I have an appreciation for the art form, but I don't have any craft. I don't have any technique. And it was the moment where I realized I need to go back to school. I need to go and really learn how to master this art form. Now, I am not saying that in order to be a really good actor, you have to go to school. Okay? So I don't want, you know, those of you that are successful or having a really great career emailing me and saying, well, fuck you, Charlie. You know, I didn't go to school and I, I'm, I work all the time. I'm not saying that, but I, you do have to train yourself, you know, and, and I, you know, I knew that I, what I didn't want to be is pedestrian. And I think that, you know, there are, are two types of actors. Um, there's the actor, you know, if, if there's a part, right, there's the actor that always brings the part down to them. I call them meat and potato actors, meaning that no matter what the role, no matter what they're doing, they, they bring it down to their pedestrian behavior, their personality, and they're the same in every role. And you can go through, I mean, a lot of celebrity, a lot of movie stars, that's what they are. They're not necessarily artists, but they've got, they're beautiful. They've got great personalities. Um, you know, stick Julia Roberts in 20 films and, you know, you've got Julia Roberts. Now, she does Julia Roberts really, really well. And you, you can't fault her. She's, you know, she's a movie star. She's no Meryl Streep. She's no Tony Collette. She's no Tony, uh, Tilda Swinton. She's no Viola Davis. You know, she's a good example of, of, of an actor that, can, that brings things down to themselves. Now, what I'm interested in, the acting that really thrills me, the artists that I think are at the top of their game, if they're going to take on a part, they bring themselves to the part. They step into the shoes of another human being. Now, that's character acting. That's transformational acting. That's your ability to transform yourself into the shoes of another human being so that everything you do is a completely fully realized human being. And that takes a tremendously developed physical instrument. So there needs to be an obsessive quality to your life. An obsessiveness to want to master your instrument to be facile, to be able to access every part of who you are, because that is ultimately what you want to be able to do, is to stand up and fully illuminate the human condition in all of its aspects, and having the confidence that every time you get a piece of material, to be able to do the homework that you need to be able to do on it, right? The, all of the, the, you know, how you break down a script and and the the detailed script analysis work that you, that you need to be able to do, right? And then to be able to walk into a room on set and be able to let your talent soar, to allow your instincts to operate, 
And you can't really do that unless you have a way of working. It's the same with athletes, right? I, I use athletes as analogies all the time. These are, you know, you look at professional athletes. I don't care what the sport is. They've been working on their craft their entire life. They've been obsessed with it. And they work on those fundamentals over and over and over and over and over again, like a, like a baseball player in a batting cage every single day, taking pitches, fielding ground balls, fielding pop-ups, so that when they get in the game, they don't have to think. Their instincts take over. And that, it's no different than with acting. You've got to work on your instrument so much. You've got to get that so embedded and ingrained in you that when you actually, you know, you hear action or the curtain goes up, like you're able to rip, right? You're able to just improvise and allow your talent to be able to take over. Now, personally, I am very, very biased to the technique that was created by Sanford Meisner, the Meisner technique. Because he developed a way of instilling in an actor all the fundamentals. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you ingrain these fundamentals in you so that they're second nature. But I will tell you this, you need to be able to be out of your head. Art is not intellectual. Acting is not intellectual. It comes from your heart. It comes from your torso. It comes from your guts. So you need to be able to get out of your head. You need to be able to get the attention off of yourself, which is what most actors struggle with, the attentions on themselves. They're worried about how they look, about how they sound. But fundamentally, you need to be able to get your attention off of yourself onto the other person or onto what you're doing. You need to forge for yourself an inviolate sense of truth. Your actor's faith, your bullshit detector needs to be rock solid. You need to know how to listen like most actors don't know how to listen. They wait for their cues. Like, I don't care what you're saying. Just give me my cue so I can act. But really great acting, the bedrock, the bedrock of acting is your ability to listen. And you need to ultimately be able to truthfully do under an imaginary circumstance. Add to that accessibility to your emotional life. Your rage, your heartbreak, your joy, your silliness, your grief, all the things I talked about earlier today. All these parts of yourself that you spend most of your life trying not to access. You know, the, the triumphs, the tragedies, the highs and the lows of our human existence. Most people are only going to experience those a handful of times in their entire life. Right? If you think about your own life and where you've been, you know, at your most humiliated, your most ashamed, your most enraged, your most heartbroken, your most overjoyed. I mean, those are searing moments in your life, right? They stay with you. They're embedded in your emotional memory. You'll, you'll remember those when you're 80. The actor has to be able to live through those eight shows a week. 25 takes on a set. I mean, you've got to have one hell of an instrument to be able to do that. And that life needs to be coursing through a body that is ultimately free and open and pliable, right? Most actors are incredibly tense and, you know, they strain and they, uh, they're locked up and you cannot have a full free expression and flow of emotion and a body that's locked up in tense. And in life, you know, you can have as much tension as you want. Be as tense as you want. But if you want to be an actor, no one wants to watch that. Because I will tell you this, an audience will experience what the actors are experiencing. And you know this if you've gone to the theater, if you're watching really poor acting on film or on television... If all you hear and see are tense actors, you're just experiencing their tension. What moves you as an audience member is to be able to sit and live vicariously through those actors, which means they have to be alive. You have to be in the presence of real human experience, not another person's tension. It's just going to make you uncomfortable. 
So, you know, there's so much work that goes into getting yourself ready to be able to do rich, complicated material. And what happens is, as an actor, you might get lucky. You know, you come to New York or you come to L.A. and maybe you, you know, somebody opens a door for you and you end up with a, an agent or a manager who thinks you've got a great look, you're gorgeous, or you're interesting, you've real got a character look, and they like you. And they might start pitching you and they end up getting you into a room. And all of a sudden you find yourself with like three, four, five pages of material. And you're expected to go into a room and be able to do something with that. And a lot of actors just don't know how to do it. And they go into these casting offices and they've got this big opportunity, right? You know, you've got this opportunity to make a good first impression, to be able to go in there and do some really good work that they are going to remember. And you go in there and you blow it, you know, because you don't have the skill set or even the, you know, the ability to be able to approach this material with any kind of insight. And after maybe a couple of months or a year of being sent out for like some really good stuff and not booking or not getting called back or not being, you know, called in for other things your agent drops you your manager drops you and you're like fuck i don't know how to act and quite honestly this is a fair number of the of the students that come to me i can tell you that 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 um have gotten to a point in their career and sometimes it's in their early 20s and sometimes they don't realize this until their 30s this defining moment when they realize they need to work and train themselves. And it's not going to happen in a scene study class. It's not going to happen in a film technique class. And it's not going to happen in some monologue class where you're memorizing some fucking monologue, walking into a room, doing what you memorized, working out how you punched all those words and all the voice inflection and everything you wanted to try to do and get some horseshit notes from somebody who doesn't even know how to act themselves. And this is why the state of American acting is in dire straits. And I, I think that's going to be a topic of a future episode, the crisis of American acting. But for now, listen, I hope anything that I said today resonates with you. Hopefully it gives you some things to think about as you move forward on your journey and you try to answer that question of the vision of the type of actor that you want to be. And before we wrap things up and call it a show, I am going to introduce a new segment... And I'm going to call this new segment Important Films and Directors That Charlie Thinks You Should Know. Okay. Our first film recommendation. This is a film that I think is very important. A director that is groundbreaking. And we're going to talk about Francois Truffaut a French director that was the epitome of what was coming out of the early 60s, the French New Wave. And I want you to watch a film called Jules and Jim, made in 1962. It was groundbreaking for many reasons. It influenced an entire generation of filmmakers. The things that he was doing in that film, the subject matter, the way he told the story, had never been done before. So let's watch it together, and let's talk about it next week. That wraps up this segment of Important Films and Directors That Charlie Thinks You Should Know. Okay, I, uh, I love this music. I don't know, it makes me feel good, and I am trying to elevate the quality of the show. So I want to wrap things up here. I'm done. I don't know about you, but let's uh, let's get the hell out of here, shall we? All right. I want to thank you for keeping that phone in your pocket and listening to everything I had to say. Subscribe, please, to this podcast on any of the platforms that you're listening to it. You can go to creatingbehaviorpodcast.com and access all of these episodes, all of the links to any of the art and artists that I have been mentioning, not just today, but in every episode. I want all of your questions, please. I want to know what your thoughts are. I want to know what you'd like to talk about, what you'd like me to answer. You can email me, charlie at creatingbehaviorpodcast.com. And thank you, Lawrence Trailer, always the theme music. The song is not enough, and you can find him at lawrencetrailermusic.com Listen everybody 
We're still in trying times. And I want to leave you with a little Brene Brown quote. I want you to be brave, be awkward, be kind, and always playful out with yourself. Take yourself seriously. And don't ever, ever settle for your second best. My name's Charlie Sandlin. Peace. Peace.